Well, as you heard, I've, uh, I've been here at UVM for, uh, since 2001, and I've spent um, um, a good part of the last 12 years working intensely uh, in my uh, field of study, which is uh, uh, condensed matter physics and materials physics. And uh, specifically, I do research on thin film materials. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk to you today about thin film materials. Um, most of the experiments that we do, however, require that our uh, materials that we use have to be in a crystalline form. And since uh, the research that we do often involves actually studying the processes by which the, uh, the films are formed, we have to learn, and myself and uh, uh, students in my, my research group, we have to learn how to make the crystalline materials uh, ourselves. So I have a, uh, quite a few experiences uh, and we work on, uh, oops, that was a little too quick, uh, we work on several uh, uh, classes of materials. So I have quite a few experiences at uh, crystallizing different materials. Um, so the, the, the task of um, material scientists is to discover and develop new materials. The de task of, uh, of uh, materials physicists and condensed matters physicists is to, is to understand their properties. Um, but, and I, I will talk to you about uh, some of the motivation. There's strong technological motivation behind developing new materials and understanding their properties and ultimately uh, exploiting them uh, in terms of uh, practical devices. But we also appreciate the intrinsic beauty of materials. And so in talking about uh, uh, thin films and crystallization, I want to, uh, I want to also uh, you know, bring out this aspect of uh, just the intrinsic beauty of nature. So I'm gonna talk today um, about my own research on thin films and specifically the part related to the uh, crystallization of films. Uh, but I'm also gonna, gonna talk about the crystals that nature makes. So um, this time of year in Vermont, crystals are literally falling from the sky. And, and so uh, uh, it seems very appropriate. Uh, and uh, I had never thought of the, the fact that both snowflakes and semiconductors are, uh, are both essential to our economy. But uh, what Professor Clowardy said was very true. <clears throat> so before I move on, let me just explain my, uh, my title slide. So I'm sure everyone, uh, everyone recognizes at the top part, which is uh, a very nice uh, dendritic snowflake. It's a, single, it's a single crystal. And then the lower part, uh, it's not a semiconductor. I, I just thought it would be interesting to see what the... Um, uh, what you would get in a diffraction pattern if you, if you diffracted light or x-rays off of a snowflake, what would it look like? And so I, uh, I uh, um, using a computer, took that image and uh, took the power spectral density of it. So it is essentially a, uh, a uh, it's another, another snowflake, but in uh, reciprocal space. <laughs> and you can see the, br the branches of the snowflake are, uh, turn out into uh, branches in the perpendicular direction. So that, explain, that explains that. Um, okay, so in terms of motivation for, uh, for uh, uh, new materials, uh, in technology, I think everyone here is probably familiar with the fact that every year we expect new developments in technology. So I just wanted to cover that a little bit um, and the most famous exponential scaling is, the, uh, is this plot that I'm showing on the uh, left-hand side of the slide. In 1959, uh, the first integrated circuits were made. Uh, July 1958 was the official discovery of the first integrated circuit. And Gordon Moore, a few years later, made this plot because they had already started to put integrated circuit just means two devices, two transistors, essentially, on a single piece of silicon. And a few years later, they were putting uh, more than that, double 
So this is uh, log, so this is like 2 to the n power, 2 squared is uh, 2 to the third power, 2 to the fourth, 2 to the fifth, 2 to the sixth, and by 1965 they were up here. And uh, so then he, Gordon Moore, extrapolated that, and that's the dashed line. And this, is, of course, is what we know now as the famous Moore's Law, which uh, is even continuing on until today uh, with almost the same slope. And so the, the number, the, the law is that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every two years, and the law has continued on since about 1960. Um, of course, this is not the only scaling law in technology. The, uh, uh, the, uh, you, can, you can make your own list, and I, I just picked a few. So battery energy density is one. It apparently doubles about every 10 years, so we almost don't even, 10 year doubling, we almost don't even notice. We're not, we're not waiting to get our next batteries necessarily, right? Uh, uh, th they're increasing fairly slowly. Aerial recording density, which I used to call magnetic recording density, but it's since been uh, almost taken over by other things like flash drives and, and so on, flash memory, uh, doubles every two years. And then one that combines several of the others, uh, which I think is quite interesting, is computations per kilowatt hour. So this is uh, one of the driving forces behind why it is that uh, personal, uh, personal electronics like cell phones and, and so forth are, uh, are becoming so ubiquitous because you have this uh, 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 computations per energy usage going down and down. It makes it a lot easier to get a lot of computing power in your pocket and the battery lifetime is good and so on. And this, uh, this trend will continue, um, however, it can't continue on forever. But before I get on to that, is let me, I, I also made one of my own because I, I just thought I should make one of my own. So here's one that I came up with, a scaling law that I found, probably someone knows about this already, but um, I found, and more appropriate to this talk on uh, crystallization is, uh, the scaling of silicon wafers area. At the same time, they're putting more transistors onto silicon wafers. They're also making the wafers bigger. And so I've plotted the data and it works out to about doubling time of about five years. Starting in 1960 with 0.9 inch diameter. This is the next generation uh, Intel wafer, which is gonna be, um, it's 18 inches across. So it's, it's gone from uh, they've gone from the size of a quarter to the size of a coffee table in, in, in the last uh, 50 some years. Um, so that's, uh, uh, it's interesting that, that's, that that piece that the uh, engineer there is holding is a single crystal. Uh, it's cut from a bool that's so large it has to be transported on a forklift. So you can, you can see uh, also the basic materials in this case, is silicon is, is uh, scaling as well. Uh, but the ultimate, sil uh, the ultimate limits of a technology like silicon would be, for example, when you get down to where a transistor is switching with just one electron. And we're not as far away from that as you might think. So what happens after that? Well, science and technology don't stop. The technology will move forward, but only if we find things like new materials that to replace silicon. A possibility which we study in our department but I'm not talking about today is graphene. Graphene might someday replace silicon. Uh, so, the, so it is the task uh, of the material scientists, the materials physicists to find these new materials uh, so that technology can, can keep going on. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about oxide materials, and so I thought I would just introduce that with uh, some of the, uh, uh, to, introduce, to represent the class of materials. Uh, many of the oxides that we work with have this perovskite structure. This would be the structure of the uh, strontium titanate, which would be SrTiO3, or barium titanate, BaTiO3. Um, and many of these materials are so-called ferroelectrics, that is that if you look at the center blue atom, the, uh, which in this case is the titanium, if it carries a charge 
and it can, it, it has a lower symmetry. It has to flip either to an up state or a down state. Well, you can easily imagine that this can be used to store a bit of information. If it's down, it's a zero, or if it's up, it's a one. And uh, there are actually companies making these so-called ferroelectric uh, random access memories. And uh, uh, but apparently it's very, very good for uh, high write, writing speed and low energy consumption, just the things I was talking about a moment ago. So there are many examples of newer technologies. Uh, you probably don't have uh, ferroelectric RAM in your pocket right now, but uh, uh, the, new, the point is that new technologies will be based on new materials, and it's the job of the scientists to come up, and, uh, come up with those new materials and learn about their properties, because there's a lot of work that has to be done before the technology can, uh, can be developed. A lot of basic research. Another area that I'm working in have worked in quite heavily is the area of organic electronics. Um, so in uh, the consumer electronics show in January, Samsung introduced uh, an uh, OLED organic light emitting uh, device television. The thing that's special about this, although you may not, might not be able to see it, is the screen is curved. One of the interesting things about uh, organic semiconductors is that they can be put onto flexible uh, plastic and so that the, uh, the entire device may be flexible. And in this case, they've taken a step in that direction by making a curved screen. Um, uh, and it, I don't know what the size of that is, but it <laughs> appears to be extremely large. Um, another technology that is coming very, very soon is white lighting. Light emitting diodes supposedly are going to we just went through changing from incandescent to fluorescent. Uh, uh, light emitting diodes are gonna, are gonna mainly replace fluorescent lighting in the next five years. And uh, they may not be organic right away, but the organic uh, white lighting is a, is a field that's moving very, very quickly. Um, also solar cells. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, some solar cells that were made here at UVM uh, by undergraduate students in my uh, experimental physics class. Uh, ours don't perform uh, at a state-of-the-art level, but they are as pretty as, as anybody else's. So I thought I would show, <laughs> I thought I would show the picture because they, they are quite gorgeous uh, in the photograph. So those are a few examples of organic electronics. Also, it's quite interesting on this topic of, of exponential scaling. Um, the first synchrotron, which is a machine that uh, emits very bright light by accelerating electrons in, in a circular orbit, was built not too far from here at General Electric in Schenectady, New York. And that was built in 1946. The first one emitted visible light I don't think you can see it, but there's an arrow there which is pointing to where the light is coming out, apparently. They took this picture with a mirror because there was also a huge amount of uh, other radiation. Um, uh, but since I work with x-rays, uh, I thought I would also show this plot. Uh, this is the brightness. It says brilliance. Brightness and brilliance are almost the same thing as a function of year. So when the synchrotrons were developed, here's the so-called first generation synchrotron, we went on to this and this is another exponential curve. We went on to this exponential curve where the brightness is going up and up. And so this, uh, with x-rays, this is kind of like going from a very, very dark room to, to a bright sunlight in, in a couple of decades. And that's where we are right now. I'm actually involved in a project right now at Brookhaven National Laboratory. There's a new machine being developed. You can see the circular. Uh, shape of it. Uh, this, is, this machine is called the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, and we're going to study uh, materials and thin film growth. Personally, myself, I'm going to study thin film growth uh, using this machine. And right now, we, we're using the National Synchrotron Light Source. This is the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, which is a, going to be one of the brightest X-ray sources uh, in the world. Uh, we're fortunate to have Brookhaven National Laboratory within driving distance of uh, UVM. And so we, we utilize this source for our research. Okay. Um, 
And then what can we do with the x-rays? This is an example from my research uh, with uh, Dr. Zhengxing Zhu, which, who was a postdoc with me a few years ago. And uh, if you put germanium atoms, I'll get to how you put them onto the surface at, at some, uh, later on, but um, if you put germanium atoms onto a silicon surface, they tend to uh, naturally self-organize and pile themselves up into these extraordinary little pyramids. This is a scanning tunneling microscope image uh, by uh, uh, Hewlett Packard research. And you can see that that's uh, a pyramid. With x-rays, we can see the pyramid shape. And here's one of our x-ray patterns. We made some of these and studied them at the National Synchrotron Light Source. These streaks are perpendicular to the faces of the pyramid. This is kind of like my snowflake example. I generated the power spectral density of the snowflake and the streaks were perpendicular to the, to the, uh, the branches on the snowflake. It's the same thing here. These streaks are perpendicular to these faces. The powerful thing here is we're not getting just a static image. We can watch, we can make a movie of these x-ray patterns and watch the structures form. And this is also a high energy electron diffraction pattern which gives us some complementary uh, information. Okay, so now uh, that was just a little preview of, of uh, the, the motivation of technology and uh, a little bit of the experimental methods that I use for my research. Now I'm going to talk about how nature does it. So we of course learn a lot from nature. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, and uh, in Vermont, you can't really start talking about snowflakes without mentioning uh, Wilson Bentley. Okay, so these are uh, uh, photographs of real snowflakes and these are photographs taken uh, by Wilson Bentley um, between about 1895 and 1931. And these are on display at the Bentley Museum in Jericho, Vermont. So uh, for those of you who haven't heard of him, Wilson Bentley, also known as Snowflake Bentley, um, was uh, a farmer. He had a farm in Jericho, Vermont. When he was 16, he, I guess, convinced his parents to get him uh, a microscope and a camera. Uh, uh, these were rare in, in, in these days, in the late 1800s. And uh, it's been likened to today if you had a 3D printer right, to have a microscope and a camera hooked together was quite an extraordinary thing. And I think it was quite unusual for a, for, a, for a farmer in Vermont to have it. Bentley spent his entire life, even right up to his death in 1931, photographing snowflakes. So the way he did it was he set things up out of, out of doors. Uh, he had a special pair of gloves that he wore, apparently, which is on display. They're on display at the museum. He caught the snowflakes on some board and then put them directly under the microscope and snapped these pictures. And, uh, and why did he do it? Uh, he was not trained as a scientist. Um, he, he, it was uh, you know, the love of the beauty, wanting to preserve these beautiful snowflakes. And he uh, thought these these beautiful patterns should be preserved for others to look at. So he had the kind of the instinct of uh, uh, that this was something that needed to be recorded. Later in, as I'll mention later in his life, uh, he also worked on uh, trying to understand how the snowflakes form. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to uh, a, a, a special event in Wilson Bentley's life, which is that when he began showing his snowflake, uh, as he called them, snow crystals, because the ones he were in, was interested in were the ones that were very perfect six-fold symmetry, so they were single crystals. When he began showing them around, he happened to show them to uh, George H. Perkins, who actually was a former uh, dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, Perkins urged Bentley to publish some of his photographs. But Bentley was not very confident of his writing skills. Uh, and eventually, it was agreed that Perkins would write the first article. So in 1898, um, this article, and I found the article. This is 
the beginning of it here. It was published in uh, Appleton's Popular Science Monthly, May 1898. Um, and uh, you, uh, you probably can't read the bit at the end. I think maybe I'll just read it to you because this is uh, George Perkins saying, uh, it's only just that I should state my share of the production of this article has been to compile its pages from Mr. Bentley's notes and photographs. The facts, theories, and illustrations are entirely due to his untiring and enthusiastic study of snow crystals. So, um, uh, Professor Perkins uh, 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 did this for Bentley, and something very notable came out of this. In this article, it mentioned this idea that no two snowflakes are alike. And this is something that actually uh, captured the public's imagination. It was, today I think we would call this going viral. It was the 1898 version of going viral. And uh, uh, Bentley then went on to write, I think, over 50 articles. Many of them in popular science types, appeared in popular science type magazines. I think there was actually one in Nature magazine. And uh, some of them were scholarly works uh, cataloging the different shapes of snowflakes, snow crystals, excuse me, and trying to understand how they could have those shapes. Okay, so that's a very, uh, it's just interesting that there's this very local connection even to the College of Arts and Sciences. So I thought that would be appropriate to mention. Okay, so uh, a little more on snowflakes. So I, when I started, and, and I'm not an expert on s snowflakes, I haven't studied them seriously, but when I started thinking about them, I had a few questions. So one of the obvious ones, why do they have six-fold symmetry? Well, I think you've probably guessed the answer already. It's because of the, uh, the molecular structure of the snow crystal, it's hexagonal. Uh, uh, getting back to Bentley, he had no idea of the molecular structure. Uh, it's really surprising, you know, how far our understanding of, of, of matter has it advanced. He thought possibly the six sides had something to do with electricity. And uh, I, I, can't, I can't see any connection there. It's, it, it's, uh, it was interesting that he would ask the question, but, but had no, um, in 1898, and even to his death in 1931, had very little chance of ever really understanding even such basic questions. Um, uh, but I have a few more questions. Why are they platelet shaped? Uh, why do tree-like tree -like branches form? And uh, one that's a little bit perplexing is, why do this, are the six branches almost identical? How does one branch know that the other one is, is shooting off a branch so that it does it at about the same time? And then some more fun questions are, why is snow and ice slippery? And then what kind of snowflakes make the best powder? I'm talking about like for skiing. I think you know the answer to that one already too. Um, anyway, so the molecular structure of ice, there are at least 10 different phases of ice, but almost all of them form only at very high pressures and low temperatures. So the only one that exists naturally on the Earth is, uh, is this ice 1H. Even at the bottom of the ocean, the pressure is not high enough to produce ice 2, uh, and you have to go to minus 80 degrees Celsius to produce ice 1C, the cubic form of ice. Uh, and apparently ice 1H does not transform directly to ice 1C. So it's, so we're, we're, we have only the ice 1H. Uh, and the H stands for hexagonal. This is the structure of the ice 1H, or at least a simplified diagram of it. There are two parts of this. In one of them, you see the, the hydrogens are in red and the oxygens are in blue. There's the hydrogen ordered variety, and then there's the hydrogen disordered variety. And I took this slide from, uh, from uh, a website at the University of Con Wisconsin Green Bay. Uh, but you can see clearly the ordered structure. This also gives you some inkling about why, you know, why they might be platelets. Um, I'm a little bit more on that. This is a schematic that shows uh, qualitatively the, the growth of the prism faces 
uh, versus the growth, of the basal, growth rates of the basal phases. So imagine in a cloud, the crystal's beginning to form, it's falling, but it's being fed by water vapor from the cloud. And a certain temperature range, the prism faces will grow much faster. So this causes it to grow out and, and, uh, and gives it, uh, makes it a more of a platelet shape. And then if, this is now a chart of the temperature. So this is the same temperature range uh, in here. It's about a, roughly a 10 degree temperature range where the best dendritic snowflakes form at high supersaturation, which means there's a lot of water vapor uh, that's where you get the beautiful uh, dendrites, which are, uh, which are, are the ones that, uh, and they're f quite fragile, and those are the ones that produce the best uh, powder for skiing. But I didn't know this really uh, until I found this chart, that there are so many other possible shapes. And of course, most uh, snowflakes are just aggregations of smaller snow crystals. Not every snowflake has these beautiful patterns. Okay, um, there's also some science that you can do with ice that I wanted to mention. Uh, since I study surfaces in thin films, we study surfaces. I'm interested in what happens at the surface. Michael Faraday actually discovered a couple of different effects. One is that if you put pressure on ice, it tends to melt. This only happens with materials that expand upon freezing, such as water expands when it turns to ice. If you press on it, you can get it to melt. This is a fairly tiny effect, though. You need a lot of pressure to, uh, to make it melt. But even without pressure, Faraday, through some simple experiments, deduced that there is a uh, sometimes called a pre-melted layer or a, a mesoscopic liquid layer on the surface of ice, even well below freezing, even without putting any pressure on it. And that this, uh, this so-called surface melting is thought to play a role in a lot of fairly practical uh, or common uh, things in nature like the charge transfer and thunderstorm, frost heave, which we have in Vermont too. And then uh, it's uh, critical for uh, snowboarding, skiing, and skating because it helps to make the ice slippery. I think I had one, I have one more thought on that, but first let me introduce since this is a surface effect, I'd like to tell you something about X-ray scattering because I'm going to show you uh, an X-ray experiment, uh, or I'm going to mention an X-ray experiment. I won't show you the, all the details. So I want to tell you a little bit about X-ray diffraction. These uh, lines introduce, uh, uh, represent a plane wave. So the black lines are just the wave crests. This arrow is just, this is a, a plane wave moving from left to right on the screen. If it encounters a surface or a collection of atoms it, that will scatter and produce a reflected wave. Okay, if I put those both on the same diagram, I get this pattern of Moria fringes. And it turns out that if the atoms are where the, the incident wave and the reflected wave are, in phase, which on this diagram, from where you're sitting, it probably looks a little bit lighter here and here and a little bit darker here and here. The in phase condition is the lighter region where the lines, the wave crests of the incident and the reflected wave cross over. So if there's an atom there, it will produce a reflected wave uh, uh, that has the phase of the one that I've shown. If there's an atom there, it will produce a reflected wave that's out of phase. Now, another key aspect of Bragg diffraction, I have a subtitle here, atomic scale ruler. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you change the angle between the incident and the reflected waves, you see you actually, by changing the angle by a factor of two, I think from two degrees to four degrees, this one is the lower angle, this one is the higher angle, you change the period of these Moriae fringes by also a factor of two. And so what happens there is, oh, going the wrong way again. What happens there is if the atoms are all uh, in the in-phase positions, 
you will produce what's called Bragg diffraction. All of the atoms scatter, the, a the, the, the reflected wave is in phase for all of them. But if there are atoms that are in the out of phase positions, they will be out of phase. So you see here, it's the same pattern of atoms, but I've gone to the bra from the Bragg condition to the off Bragg condition just by changing the angles. So this is how we do X-ray scattering in an experiment. In this situation, where I have half of the atoms out of phase with the other half, the crystal to the X-rays becomes again invisible. The, 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 scattered, the out of phase scattered waves exactly cancel the in phase. This is the way that we actually study surfaces because if something different is happening on the surface, this by going to what we actually call the anti-Bragg condition, you can be sensitive to a surface. And this is, even though it sounds simple, it's very, very powerful. And you can get a lot of information about surfaces and also a very thin single molecule level uh, thin films uh, with this, this effect. And so getting back to why is ice slippery, this experiment has been done. Uh, there's a group in Germany who worked on this in the 1990s. Uh, they didn't just do it with ice cubes. They had to make special ice 1H. Of course, all, as I mentioned, all uh, uh, ice that occurs naturally on Earth is ice 1H. But they had to be single crystals, which is a little bit harder. And then they scattered x-rays off of the surface. And what they found was by going to the, uh, they, they, the by, go, by going to this, uh, uh, anti-Bragg condition, uh, it's highlighted in blue, I doubt that you can read it, they found that there is a thin surface layer. It's a, a thin surface layer that's between 10 and 20 nanometers thick, and it exists well below the freezing point of ice. And uh, uh, there was some extra room on the slide, so I put a couple of well-known uh, UVM, al UVM alumni hockey players there who rely on the fact that the ice is slippery. Um, so exactly why ice is slippery has been under debate since uh, Michael Faraday's time. And this seems to be one of the main effects, this mesoscopic surface layer uh, of liquid on the surface makes the ice, is one of the main effect that makes the ice slippery. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna turn back to uh, some other uh, research topics in the time that I have remaining. Um, so, as I've already mentioned, a lot of my research is, uh, and, and my research uh, group, we study uh, 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 thin film materials, but specifically, a, a big part of the crystal growth studies is that we do real-time studies. That is, we actually try to see how a process evolves with time, instead of just getting a snapshot of what happened after uh, some material is already made. We try to study the processes. <coughs> and uh, X-ray scattering is one of our main techniques. We also use high energy electron diffraction. For some things, if, if, if the conditions are right, we can use uh, optical microscopy techniques. And, uh, and to some extent, we also use computer simulations to help model uh, 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 what we observe in, ex in experiments. In many cases, such as in X-ray scattering, you don't, get an, you don't get a picture, you get a diffraction pattern in which, which uh, uh, needs to be interpreted. Um, also, things like atomic force microscopy, usually that gives you only a static image, and we, we, uh, we do a lot of other things to characterize our materials, including making uh, transistors, doing various kinds of electrical and optical characterization. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the fundamentals of, of uh, uh, aggregation and crystallization. Just, and these are relevant to the snowflakes also. So I'll, I'll mention uh, how, th how this is relevant to snowflakes. So a, uh, a model for quite a few different things that uh, can form in nature, such as bacterial colonies, smoke particles are actually composed of much tinier carbon particles. And what happens is that if you have uh, small particles undergoing random walk and coming in from the, f f for example, from the edges of this image, they will tend to stick together. 
but they tend to stick at the ends of the branches because by, for them to diffuse into the interior by chance is very unlikely because it's more likely that, likely that they will encounter one of these branches sticking out. And this um, idea is, uh, is called diffusion-limited aggregation. It was proposed by, uh, by Witten and Sander uh, in, in uh, 1981. Um, this is a two-dimensional version of diffusion-limited aggregation. And this is a simulation. This is uh, by Sangeeta Sengupta. It's part of her uh, final, uh, final project for the computational physics last semester. She generated this, this nice pattern. And uh, it shows, it shows a, a fractal that has been formed in a simulation simulating this diffusion-limited aggregation. This idea is often invoked to explain the branch-like structures of snowflakes. And so you can, uh, you can imagine, of course, in this model, the material doesn't have to be crystalline. It can be smoke particles, which are not, car you know, carbon particles, which are perhaps not even crystalline. It can be bacteria colonies. It can be all kinds of different things. Um, but if the material is crystalline, you'll get the branching structure and then in the snowflake, in the, the perfect snow crystals, the hexagonal symmetry comes from the, uh, the crystals, the, the molecular structure, but the branches are coming from the fact that the water vapor coming in from the environment is more likely to stick to the end of the, of the, of the branches. And so this idea actually is relevant to, uh, to the snowflakes and, and many of the other experiments that we study. Um, another idea is if you do have a single crystal, the faces or facets of the crystal are not just perfect. There tends to be what we call uh, steps. And uh, that's because, uh, for example, if you cut, say, a diamond, if you cut a facet on a diamond, it's very difficult to cut it exactly parallel to the atomic planes, right? Over some macroscopic distance, you just, that angle would be, there's, you can't cut it exactly on an angle. And when crystals grow naturally, there is always some very, very tiny misorientation. And so you always have these molecular level steps. And uh, Burton Cabrera and Frank uh, figured this out in 1951, that the way crystals grow is that individual uh, particles, be they atoms or molecules or some type of monomer, comes in and attaches to the jags on, on, the, uh, on the step they called kinks. So they, it attaches to the kink sites. And this is how single crystals tend to grow, attachment to steps and attachment to kink sites. Uh, this is an example from our research, which is a single crystal of strontium titanate, an oxide uh, material which has a perovskite structure and you can see in this atomic force microscope image this is a uh, four micron by four micron image uh, and these are steps that are only four angstroms high but you can see they're nice uh, nice straight parallel steps so this is our this is our two-dimensional playground for uh, for growing our thin films um, now I'm going to get to the examples uh, we're working on organic semiconductors, but I've worked a lot on a special process for making organic semiconductors, thin films, from a solution. And the solution is applied uh, through this rectangular uh, stylus, which it's very much like a ballpoint pen, except it's a little bit specialized because it's a rectangular shape. And we're, as the solution as the solvent evaporates from the solution, it leaves behind the molecules that are dissolved in the solution. And we can write these films, which are qu quite extraordinary, in the sense that they can be single crystalline films with uh, grain sizes that are visible to the naked eye, but film thicknesses that are only on the scale of about 20 nanometers. They're very, very thin. This is what you need, actually, for uh, for uh, organic electronics, so specifically transistor devices. Uh, we're studying the basic processes. And this is our apparatus with a, a microscope with a video camera attachment. And this is our little uh, stylus here. We can actually uh, monitor how these crystals grow. 
This is a model that shows the, uh, this bluish molecule is called uh, pentacene. It's five carbon rings all attached together. This is a particular, uh, the circles are uh, the triisopropyl silenethyl uh, groups. So this we call this tips pentacene, because as you can see, I can't pronounce the full name. Uh, we call this tips pentacene. And uh, that's a soluble molecule, and we can coat it out onto surfaces. And it crystallizes. And this diagram just shows two grains. You see one, the, in one grain, the molecules are oriented one way. And then in the other one, they're oriented with a different angle. And uh, these two have a special relationship in that one is the other one flipped over. We call that uh, actually a twin boundary. So, uh, so this is what we actually see. And now this is the big moment where I try to get the movie to play. This is what we actually see in the video microscope. Um, I'll try to narrate this. It goes rather quickly. OK, at the top of the screen, you'll see the liquid solution up here. And then the substrate, which is being pulled out from underneath, has got the semiconductor layer being coated onto it. And you can see, this is extraordinary, that at the, there's a boundary between the liquid where the crystals are actually being pulled out of it. In the second one, we go to a higher speed. This is under different conditions with cross polarizers. So the liquid looks dark. It looks like the film is emerging from a shadow. But the, the darkness is simply because in the liquid state, there's no polarization contrast. And once the solid forms, and there's this very sharp boundary, we're having trouble discerning the width of this boundary, uh, the, the molecules order. And then the, fil the film, the ordered crystalline film, comes out of it. In this image, it's as if from nowhere. But in the previous image I showed you, it's coming out of the liquid solution. Now this is the fastest speed. This one is also quite extraordinary. You'll see something flash by. And now we're just looking at liquid, because we've moved the stage so fast. Oops, I wasn't fast enough. We've moved the stage so fast that we're looking at a liquid, but then as the solution, as the solvent evaporates, eventually the, the material crystallizes. Now this is the same thing in uh, uh, two seconds per frame instead of 15 frames per second. So now again, we're looking at the liquid solution. And you can begin to see the nucleation of the crystalline organic semiconductor. And again, these, these are only 10 to 20 nanometers thick, but this whole uh, the area of this is something like a millimeter. You can see them crystallizing. And then they grow out very rapidly, and they run into each other. You can see there's even, in some places, a fairly sharp boundary where the crystallites come together. It's, uh, anyway, I play this over and over again. <laughs> we have more uh, that are very, very nice. This particular, uh, these movies were uh, made by Song Tao Wo, who was uh, uh, now graduated, but was a graduate student in my uh, group. OK, and then I'm also going to mention complex oxide materials. This is a little bit different. It requires a vacuum environment with some oxygen. A laser beam vaporizes a tiny bit of a target, makes this plume. Here's a photograph of the plume. The plume uh, is uh, essentially a plasma. So the elements, it could be two or three or four different elements, like uh, uh, strontium titanate, strontium titanium and oxygen, or uh, in our case, bismuth iron and oxygen. Uh, so those, those atoms go and then are deposited onto a substrate, which is heated to some uh, temperature uh, where the crystallization can occur. This is an atomic force microscope image. Remember, I showed you the terraced surface. This is a terraced surface that's had seven unit cells worth of bismuth iron oxide deposited on it by this pulse laser deposition process. You can see the remnant of the terrace, but then there's also something else, some other features there. If we zoom in, you can begin to see that those features are actually these circular clusters. And if we zoom in further, you can see them a little bit better. What happens here, the pulse of vapor 
uh, leaves all of these atoms scattered around the surface. And this is actually a supersaturated vapor in two dimensions. And then that vapor aggregates. Uh, there is a part of the process that we call the aggregation phase, which is similar to the diffusion limited aggregation. The difference here is these don't form fractals because th when the, the atoms attach to the edges of the clusters, they can diffuse into the interior. And so you can imagine like a water droplet doesn't like to be in an irregular shape. It always changes to a, uh, to a circular shape. So we get these compact islands. But this is very much akin to the organic semiconductor where we had, as the solvent evaporates, we have a supersaturated solution and then the crystallization happens explosively. Here, we instantaneously, or well not instantaneously, but in less than a microsecond, we drop a bunch of atoms onto a surface. It's a supersaturated two-dimensional vapor, essentially, which then aggregates. And then, I won't spend too much time on this, but this is the uh, X-ray diffraction experiment done at Brookhaven. This is a, f an, a frame of the raw data from the uh, from the X-ray experiment, this ring is actually produced by the circular clusters. And then we study, this is a single frame. If I take a profile of that in this direction and then plot it as a function of time, rather than playing you the movie, you can just look at this one. The ring appears and disappears and appears and disappears. This is the process that we call uh, layer by layer crystal growth. The layer you saw the clusters, they form, but then when you do another pulse and another pulse, they eventually grow together. They complete one layer, and then the next pulse starts the following layer. I have a simulation that shows a little bit of this process. This is not a complete layer, but you can see starting off from some clusters and then depositing some atoms. This is a, a simulation. Uh, Michael Rushford was an undergraduate student uh, in the uh, physics department. Uh, who worked on this. And then uh, the, the vapor then forms tiny clusters, but then the, the larger clusters grow at the expense of the smaller ones. This is actually over several uh, orders of magnitude of time scale, which are all encapsulated in this little movie. The movie has to speed up at some point, so you don't, it would take a thousand times longer to show it, so it's not quite, it's not, not quite the, uh, the real-time uh, movie, but you can see that the clusters at the end are a little bit larger than they were, and then eventually they will grow together, and then the yellow layer will cover up the red layer. Actually, there's even a little bit of the next layer. The, 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 the white blobs are the third layer, which will then eventually cover up the yellow layer. So this is the layer-by-layer -layer process. Okay, now to finish, I'm almost uh, done and I wanted to bring it back to, uh, to, uh, to water and ice, just in case you are still thinking about snowflakes. Now that I've shown you the uh, crystallization from supersaturated solutions in two different material systems, let's come back to uh, what, uh, what Doug Beck did this summer, I think mainly by accident in his uh, you see, if your freezer is not too much below the freezing point, uh, the water in, his, in, in your, uh, uh, this is just a bottle of spring water, it doesn't freeze, but it's below the temperature where it should be uh, ice. And what happens is if you disturb it in some way, and I hope you'll be able to see this, if you disturb it in some way, you can see the crystallization happening explosively uh, inside. I hope you can see that. Maybe I'll play it once more just in case. Inclo explosively inside of the, uh, the bottle starts off as a liquid and then it crystallizes from the top to the bottom. If you hit it in a different spot, sometimes it will crystallize from a, from a different spot. So the crystallization nucleates and then it, uh, it propagates through the uh, Eventually, the whole thing turns to solid. Here's another thing that you can do, in case you weren't convinced by that one. If you pour this stuff out, it, as you pour it into the Tupperware, it turns 
It's kind of like a snow cone or something. It turns from liquid state to a crystalline state. This is the same kind of idea. You have a supercooling, supercooled uh, liquid, which uh, it wants to turn to a solid, but it needs a little bit of encouragement, such as bringing it into contact which is with something that's already a crystal is, uh, is a good way to set it off. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, and then finally, I just want to acknowledge my group members. I've shown you a bunch of different slides based upon the work of uh, uh, many of, of uh, my group members. So I mentioned Doug. Uh, he was in the, uh, uh, here we're showing the uh, support from the UVM Complex Materials. It's the Research Experience for Undergraduates program. Uh, Ishveen Kaur and Sangeeta Sengupta are graduate students. Um, in the material science program, T.J. Howard, Thomas J. Howard is an undergraduate. Priya Chenta is a postdoc in my group, and uh, Jeff Olbrand is a graduate student. And Evan Laird is a recently graduated uh, uh, Bachelor of Science student. And I've also listed some alumni from my group and uh, uh, financial support for my research. So that is all I have. Thank you very much.